Welcome to Asia and America in the post-pandemic world. It's 5.30 p.m. in Northern California, 8.30 in the morning in Singapore, where our special guest speaker, Parag Khanna, is joining us. To tell you more about today's topic and to introduce Parag, we have Mary Kay Magistad, who is our moderator and joins us from here in San Francisco. A little bit about Mary Kay. She was a Beijing-based China correspondent for about 15 years. She opened up NPR's first Beijing bureau in the mid-1990s and then returned for the BBC PRO PRI program of the world. She's reported in every province in China, that's at least 23 provinces, in most countries in Asia and in several countries in Africa as well. She's covered China's fast economic growth and rise as a global power and how that's impacted people's lives and reshaped the world economy, the environment, and political equations. Mary Kay also created a podcast, Whose Century Is It? And she's now working on another new podcast called On China's New Silk Road. It was reported around the world. It shows the global impact of China's ambition, including that enormous Belt and Road Initiative, which you're going to be hearing about much more in today's program. So Mary Kay, next time we need you to come and speak to Asia Society. We have a terrific audience today. Joining us is our chair, Ken Wilcox. We have board members, Tom Gold, Bakul Joshi, Jack McCauley, Sheila Melvin, and Jay Shu. Asia Society trustee, Thierry Porte, who helped launch our center in Tokyo is on the line. Our Houston Center president, Bonna Cole is with us. We have young leader representatives, Chuck Ng and Asahi Choi. Our groundbreaker and innovator members, thank you always for supporting us and for joining us. We welcome you too. Welcome also to Canadian Consul General, Rana Sarkar. I'm Margaret Conley, the executive director of our Northern California Center. Today's program is recorded and it's on the record and we really want to hear from you. So if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Again, use that Q&A box, not the chat box, use the Q&A box and get your questions going. And now I'd like to uh, welcome Mary Kay. Well, thank you, Margaret. And it's a real pleasure for me to be able to introduce Parag Khanna because in working on my Belt and Road, New Silk Road podcast, Parag's work has been a huge help in thinking in uh, importantly rigorous ways about what's happening, not just with what China's doing with the New Silk Road, but also what Asia is doing and reconnecting itself. So Parag is the founder and managing partner of Future Map, which is a data and scenario-based strategic advisory firm. He's written six books, which have been translated into 20 languages. He himself speaks six languages, German, Hindi, French, Spanish, and basic Arabic, and of course, English. Uh, his books include The Future is Asian, Commerce, Conflict, and Culture in the 21st Century, which came out last year, and Connectography, Mapping the Future of Global Civilization, which came out in 2016. And that's, that argues that the future will be shaped less by national borders than by global supply chains. Parag was born in India uh, and grew up in the United Arab Emirates, New York, and Germany. He got a PhD in international relations from the London School of Economics, and he has a bachelor's and a master's degree from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He has been, among many things, an advisor to the U.S. National Intelligence Council's Global Trends 2030 program. Uh, he's been a senior geopolitical advisor to U.S. Special Operations in Iraq and Afghanistan in 2007. He's provided expertise to dozens of other governments in Europe, Asia, and South America. In 2016, he served on the Singapore Government's Committee on the Future, Committee on the Future Economy. Um, he's been a senior research fellow to, at the New America Foundation, at the National University of Singapore Center on Asia and Globalization at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and he's been a Global Governance Fellow at the Brookings Institution. He has done multiple TED Talks, many other talks at international conferences on global trends and scenarios, system risks, risks and technological disruptions, among other things. Uh, he's often brought on as an analyst and commentator on the BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, CNBC, and other broadcasts. And his articles and essays have appeared in many top publications, including the Financial Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, the Atlantic, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, and Quartz. His 2008 essay for the New York Times Magazine, Waving Goodbye to Hegemony, sparked international debate about how global power is shifting. And with that, I'm going to turn over to Parag, who will talk for about 10 minutes and share some of his thoughts about the central questions that we're going to be talking about today, about how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting 
the global economy, global supply chains, and the Belt and Road. Parag, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Mary Kay, for that very generous introduction. And uh, I wish that you and I had overlapped in some of this, uh, some of this backpacking over the last uh, decade or more along the Silk Roads. But uh, long may they continue to flourish. So I'm sure we'll have the chance. But thank you so much, and I can't wait for this conversation. And thank you, Margaret, uh, and your Asia Society team for for hosting me. As as, as all of you know, uh, Asia Society has been particularly in the last year, but actually going back a bit further, really central. Uh, you know, to uh, for for my uh, discussions and, and promotion of the Asia book around the world, the audiences and the, the, the caliber uh, of the conversation has always been incredibly first rate. And I just, you know, such a strong supporter of the Global Asia Society Network uh, as it's expanded over the last, uh, you know, decade and, and more. So, uh, so thank you again so much for this opportunity. Um, would have been lovely in person, but I guess we've all gotten used to the new format. Uh, so with that in mind, um, Rexel, if you wouldn't mind uh, putting up, uh, I'm just gonna share just four or five slides to set the stage for the conversation, uh, for which to which I'm really, really looking forward. So I'll just go through it relatively quickly. Um, uh, Rex, let's go to the next one. Great. So what I want to just point out here, I do want to, you know, actually, uh, I should say as a caveat that, of course, a huge part of what I've been trying to do in the last few years is to move us beyond China in our understanding of Asia. And we can get into all of that, of course, in greater detail. But obviously, it's a useful point of departure to look at, uh, at, at this sort of near term and China itself. So initially, and this is something that I'll just say really bothered me, we had a lot of people on Twitter and elsewhere talking about how mask diplomacy and you know a health Silk Road diplomacy would somehow burnish China's image. And I had to shake my head because I thought to myself, well, you know, there are about four and a half billion people in this neck of the woods that I happen to live in right now, and who know perfectly well what the geographical origin of this virus is, and no amount of surgical mask is really going to paper over that. And yet you could have people, you know, reporting about how uh, just because a few politicians in Italy or in South Africa or Brazil are grateful for the delivery of Chinese medical supplies, and even more broadly, mind you, um, that, that somehow this would turn things around in terms of, uh, you know, the sort of China's image in the wake of COVID-19. And this is before the wolf warriors, uh, of course. So, you know, potentially one might have said that uh, if, if there were enough people lacking in, in geographical knowledge or diplomatic or political integrity, uh, that this narrative would prevail. But obviously no such thing was really ever gonna happen, uh, certainly not in my view. And again, before the wolf warriors really um, put that to rest. So what what comes next? What can China do to strengthen its sort of, you know, credentials and, and trust basically, uh, which has really been, been torched uh, it, as a result of the way COVID-19 has been managed? Uh, one, you know, and, and here I'm looking at, again, so there is obviously the, the potential for China to play an even stronger role distributing medical supplies, ideally ones that are functional uh, around the world to countries that need them. Of course, there's gonna be competition in that landscape uh, out of the pharmaceutical industry and the 3D printing industry and so forth. All over the world, as countries realize that they need to diversify their supply chains and sourcing of, um, of all things related to, to the healthcare industry. One analog that's worth looking at is the post-1998 financial crisis, quote, early harvest programs. And that's when China substantially reduced tariffs on trade partners, particularly in Southeast Asia, to help them recover uh, from the shock of the Asian uh, crisis. Uh, at this point in time, however, uh, trade tariffs are already relatively low. Uh, so it's really a question of does China deepen the policy that it began a couple of years ago with uh, just slashing uh, import restrictions and tariffs across the board on all of its major trade partners in all Belt and Road countries uh, for the sake of offsetting uh, the declining trade with the United States. Now that is something I can imagine China doing, even though it doesn't really need those imports as much anymore, even though uh, you know it's a, you know, even dipped into a trade deficit position, but this would be a diplomatic gesture. More broadly, and now let me speak to the points on the bottom of this slide. Um, what, what I have been trying to, to argue for is that Eurasia is inevitably, and this is you know, obviously a pre-pandemic argument, but strengthened uh, most certainly in the reaction, the, the backlash against China uh, due to the pandemic, that, 
that Asia was not heading towards a situation where China would be would have a you know a secure hegemonic position, but rather consistent with the last four thousand years, with very few exceptions, like you know the Mongol uh, era, Asia has been multipolar. The full geographical expanse of Asia has been multipolar, and the kind of linear projections that China was going to reconstitute a neo tributary model were vastly overblown and really did not take into account the reactions to China's actions, which are as important as China's actions. And that's what looking at kind of the relationship between complexity and geopolitics teaches you is not to make linear projections of any kind. And of course, again, COVID-19 makes perfectly clear why one shouldn't do that in the case of any power, uh, China included. So one of the things that was underway prior to the pandemic was that the Belt and Road was a wake up call to the Europeans, Americans, uh, Indians, Japanese, and others to come up with their own ways of offering concessionary lending and finance uh, to the poorer developing Asian countries as a way of competing with Belt and Road. And now that you have the IMF extending emergency credit lines valued up to a trillion dollars collectively to more than half the countries in the world, and the World Bank with more than $200 billion of lending as well, there's an opportunity for the international community ex-China to, you know, come up with a stable uh, sources of capital, access to capital, uh, you know, for these countries so that they can start to dilute or shift away from their dependency on China, even if China does move forward. And this is something that the Exim Bank of China is debating right now, you know, whether they're going to suspend uh, interest or even principal payments on debt, um, whether or not uh, they want to move forward, uh, because of course they've seen what happens when you can be too heavily indebted uh, to China. Last point on this slide is about the military uh, dimension, in which, uh, as you probably know, the US has been convening India, Australia, and Japan into this squad formation or coalition to not only coordinate maritime uh, military strategy more effectively to work in the name of um, in the name of um, maintain, in the name of sort of maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific, which is the term that's that's commonly used, uh, but also to support some of the littoral countries in the South China Sea. Uh, like uh, Vietnam and Indonesia and the Philippines to, to uh, be more confident <clears throat> in defending their maritime claims. So there was this pushback for years. It's going to only accelerate now is the bottom line here. Let's just go to the next slide. I'll, I'll move a bit more quickly now. Uh, so what does this mean for Belt and Road? Well, again, <clears throat> prior to Belt and Road, you had a pretty substantial diversion or recalibration of China's focus and interests uh, and, and, and uh, capital allocation in terms of investment and lending, uh, pulling back from some of the far-flung geographies of uh, South America and, and, and Africa towards the immediate periphery, uh, whether it's Russia, Central Asia, or Southeast Asia. And you can see this in the um, uh, in the slide here in the lower, in the, in the image here on the lower right uh, that shows the countries that have been most heavily, you know, implicated and involved in Belt and Road. And then regionally as well, you see that, again, that the, the immediate Asian geographies are benefiting the most. So this means that, uh, you know, you're going to, this is accelerating the broader point that I think has been underway for a number of years. And this is what the next slide, let's go to the next slide. And, and this, uh, what it shows is that the world has been moving into a much more regional uh, you know, tripolar regional framework uh, for a number of years now. And in the background, what you see are the kind of, um, this is this is from the Asia book, basically showing uh, the kind of bubbles that correspond to GDP in PPP terms. You can see that you basically have a North American, a European, and an Asian system. And that's where we were in 2019. And we were moving more and more towards that world as a result of the fact that oh, it, the trade war had a big impact on it, right? But as of last year, the U.S. trades more each with Canada and Mexico than with China. Uh, so you have a, you know, and then you had U.S. and ZA uh, passed. Europe obviously trades far more internally than it does externally. And Asia has had already moved towards 60% internal trade. So now if you think about how difficult it is for us to travel between regions, if you think about investment restrictions, protectionism, nationalism, nearshoring, and all of those things simultaneously piling on or compounding each other, you move towards a world where things are gonna be a lot more regional. Migration has largely been regional anyway. Um, and, uh, and then so on and so forth. So there's a lot of, you know, sub, sub points and arguments here that relate to supply chains and capital flows and so forth. But we're also again seeing this in, in the news uh, sector by sector. There is the um, 
just in the last uh, 72 hours, you've had uh, you know the White House putting forward a number around what they would use in a fund, put into a fund to subsidize near foreshoring manufacturing. The TSMC announcement around doing a uh, semiconductor plant in Arizona, um, and any number of other uh, steps. And of course, now uh, a strong push in Congress. Um, to restrict uh, American pension funds from investing uh, in uh, Chinese mainland uh, equities. And potentially now, just yesterday, uh, the, the delisting of Chinese companies from American exchanges. So you've got a pretty serious decoupling going on here. But a decoupling does not mean an intensification of intra-regional activity. So get used to seeing this kind of tripolar framework, basically, uh, in which you really have a three-speed and a three regional kind of kind of framework. That's the way it's going to be. And it, again, heading there before the pandemic, but there's no question that that's going to accelerate. Uh, last one or two slides. Uh, let's just go to the next one. What does this mean for Asia itself? Can Asia achieve a certain degree of self-sufficiency, uh, you know, absent the notion that it is dependent on exports of finished goods to North America and Europe? The, the, the very, very simple answer is yes. And we, we always underestimate others, the other. We certainly do so even with respect to Asia, despite all Asia has accomplished. And Asia is the zone of the world where you have a substantial degree of pragmatism around trade liberalization. And the fact that the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership was passed last year by most countries, not by India, but for its own set of reasons, uh, it is the kind of port portends a very substantial intensification of trade within the region. Uh, and again, it's already reached 60%, as I showed earlier, it can easily go to 70, 75%. Now just think of economics as land, labor, and capital, right? I mean, in Asia, you've got the population, the industry, the natural resources, uh, the technology, uh, you know, and, and the money, right? All it, it, it is there. It's really about optimizing it. And that's what Europe, that's what Asia has been doing for the last couple of decades. And RCEP will kick that to, to take it up to the next level. It benefits the wealthy countries that have high tech exports. It benefits the poorer countries that can be the new geography of uh, factory production supply chains. And this is what Southeast Asia uh, has been doing uh, quite well over the last decade is attracting in that new foreign investment that would have gone to China. Japan has you know, allocated a big fund towards uh, divestment from China. That doesn't mean that they're gonna strengthen production in, in Japan, of course. It's really all gonna continue to go to Southeast Asia, as has been. So you see that Vietnam and Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines become principal beneficiaries of this. And these are, again, the more open economies. They're happy to be part of TPP and RCEP, and that's been the recipe for success. Um, I think that's the last slide. Maybe there's one more. Yes. Okay. This is the final point. Let's go back to that tripolar kind of system. You know, this does not mean that the world chooses between America and China. And, and I think it's extremely important that we get this right because it, we've slipped into that we meaning sort of, let's just say the blob, you know, it slipped into this frame of so, someone came along one day, maybe six or seven years ago and posited this false choice between an American and Chinese, uh, you know, sort of world order. Uh, neither is true. Neither is what's going to happen, right? Uh, what you see here, and I'm bringing Europe in as a, as a foil, and a, as, as, as kind of a um, a lens through which to view this, uh, this kind of multi-alignment and the desire of most regions of the world not to play, not to take any one side, but to play all sides as much as possible. And Europe is indicative of this, and it's certainly the, the other most important region. Uh, it certainly is the most important in terms of share of global trade that it represents. And if you see on the upper right there, the 1.6 trillion, right, that's the volume of Euro-Asian trade. It's far larger than any other axis of trade in the world, you'll probably see North American Asian trade decline. So the only really vector of trade that's going to grow in the entire world between any two pair of regions for the foreseeable future is that between Europe and Asia. You probably saw yesterday's headline around a survey that was done by the Kruger Foundation in, in Germany that was saying that, you know, an equal number, or equal proportion of respondents in Germany say that having a good relationship with China is as important as with America. What Europeans basically, you know, they allow economics to guide their foreign policy. Not really all that bad an idea, quite frankly. Uh, it has its pros and cons, but compared to what we've got going on right now, it would make a lot of sense. Uh, and they've been looking at this, at this data for a long time and saying, wait a minute, 
you know, we literally trade more with China uh, or with Asia more broadly than we do with the United States. Why would we let our membership in, um, you know, Belt and Road or the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or other, um, you know, free trade agreements with, as they've just signed with Japan, what they want to have with with uh, with ASEAN and eventually with India, pushing for more reciprocal market market access with China. That heavy and great engagement strategy is typical of Europe in general, and certainly applies in explaining the divergence between the European approach to Asia and the American approach to to China in particular and Asia in general. When it comes to to the economic and commercial uh, policies. So on the one hand, you have Europeans talking as tough as the US on investment restrictions and on reciprocity and this kind of thing, but their approach to, to achieving that outcome is very, very different. So expect this to be a, a tripolar world, but not one in which countries have to choose between the US and China, because the answer there, I have maintained, I guess, for the last 15 years, the answer is neither. And I think that is what is playing itself out. So. With that, uh, sorry for going on so long. Can't wait for the conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Parag, for such a rich framing of the issues about how um, COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic uh, is affecting the global supply chain and the Belt and Road and the global economy. Uh, one of the things I, I really appreciate about your writing and your analysis is that you take a very long view. So, you know, when you look at COVID and you look at the pandemic, uh, and what it's doing now, what it may be doing in years to come. Do you think that this significantly will change how China approaches the Belt and Road? I know that when you've talked about the Belt and Road, you're like, look, it existed before 2013 when Xi Jinping announced it in Astana and Kazakhstan. It's not just the infrastructure that China's building. They may have conceptualized it as a hub and spokes with China at the center and a new world order that where you know, China's the benevolent uh, leader of the whole thing it's not really necessarily going to go that way. Others have jumped in. But in terms of China's part in that, given that their economy is taking a significant hit and is likely to, by some estimates, will only have a growth rate this year, somewhere between 1.5 and 2%, the lowest since the end of the Cultural Revolution in 1976. What does that mean for what China can do with the Belt and Road? Mm -hmm. So I would, again, to me, Belt and Road, first of all, has been something that began in the year 1991, right? It, it began the day the Soviet Union collapsed, because that's when it, that's when Belt and Road was enabled. However, it wasn't Belt and Road then. It was the broader process of Eurasian infrastructural integration and connectivity. And you and I have been, both been looking at it. You know, I wrote such a huge chunk of my first book about your Chinese financing and infrastructure in Central Asia, there was no Belt and Road then. So what was I looking at, right? I was looking at Eurasian infrastructural integration and China didn't play a massive role in it until the mid 2000s, right? Europeans led the way, Japanese financing led the way and so on and so forth. So what you have always had is a, um, not a multilaterally coordinated, but a significant number of players, let's not forget the European Bank for Reconstruction Development, let's not forget the Asian Development Bank, uh, have been financing this. Now, what Belt and Road is, is a huge bazooka that's added, right, heft and momentum to that process. Uh, because a lot of people kind of woke up in the year 2015 and they're like, oh, China's announced Belt and Road. There was no new Silk Roads, there was no infrastructure, there were no pipelines until that point in time. Obviously not true, right? You'd already had almost 20 years worth of efforts. So China's taken that up to sort of you know, added the steroids to the process. And it led people to believe that therefore all roads lead to China. But the truth is that you've got big efforts on a north-south Silk Road from Russia through Iran to India, right? You've got uh, Central Asian countries connecting you know, to, to each other. You've got north, south, east, west, a whole variety of projects going on, many of which relate to China but not all of which. And you can perfectly conceive of trade linkages and diversification and investment going on without China driving and steering it. And so what I meant to say earlier with the kind of arc from Belt and Road 1.0 to 2.0 to, to sort of 3.0 with a question mark, and this, this is the setting your very valid question, is how does China modify its approach going forward? If 1.0 was too dominant and overbearing and uh, you know, basically earned the reputation of being debt trap diplomacy. 2.0 is sort of, you know, let's make nice with all the other partners and let's get Europeans to, let's multilateralize it, let's have everyone feel like they're owners of it, and let's in any case uh, distribute the risk, right? Because 
here comes China taking on a huge, uh, you know, a huge lending portfolio. And there's going to be a lot of defaults. There's going to be write downs. There's going to be project failures. And actually, when you look at the activities of Chinese multilateral lenders or even Chinese corporates, the further they are from China, the more they know that, that Beijing's not going to bail them out if it fails. And the more they act like, you know, more or less predictable uh, international corporations. Um, and so you have the situation where China actually wants, in many ways, uh, this process to be multilateralized. And then 3.0, too early to say exactly how we would characterize it, but the early signs are there that, that again, reinforcing 2.0, Better to have multiple cooks in the kitchen than to have it all depend on China. Uh, huge normative pressure to write down debt. Uh, huge pressure for more local ownership. Uh, significant restrictions, and you and I were talking offline about this at the beginning, you know, huge new restrictions on foreign investment that India, uh, Kazakhstan, even Southeast Asia, even weaker countries, so strong countries like Australia and India have already imposed very significant insurmountable regulatory restrictions on, on majority Chinese ownership of strategic assets, right? Whether it's blocking ownership of utilities or whether it's Huawei and what Huawei can do. Even poorer countries can do this. That's what sovereignty is. It's the last figment, you know, of, of uh, you know, equality in a very asymmetric world. It's to say, you know what, we're Mongolia, we're weak, but we're just, it's in the law, you know, even, even um, incorruptibly so in some areas that foreigners will just never be able to own as much as, you know, they wanted to. So China is going to have to make the adjustments and recalibrate. And Belt and Road in the end will not be, again, the, it will still be a, a, a huge contributor to this Eurasian infrastructural finance, but it won't be the only thing. And as I said, Europe has launched its Asia Connectivity Initiative. World Bank and IMF are now back on the scene in the region in ways they haven't been in, in more than a decade. Uh, India and Japan are launching their, their you know, connectivity corridors. The US and Australia and New Zealand have their blue dot network and so on. So you will have this dilution of Chinese uh, dominance. And I think, you know, I think quite frankly, it's a very healthy thing. China still benefits, let's be absolutely clear, the purpose of Belt and Road is supply chain diversification and infrastructural access to its major trading partners. That's what it's about. Um, so China still gets that, it just doesn't get to dominate all the routes. Do you think though, in the wake of the pandemic, with so many economies you know, going into recession as a result of it, that connectivity takes a hit for a few years? Um, it depends on which countries can survive as you know, domestically protected, you know, large populations and consumption driven uh, growth. And, and there are a couple of countries that have a certain degree of cushion or resilience, like India, let's say. But most countries, you know, do of course depend to to a considerable degree on a trade and export. So you know, the Vietnams and the Thailands and and, and Malaysia's and so forth. And they're going to continue with any number of these projects because they it's still in their long term interest. It's part of their growth model. It's not an either or trade off between taking on debt to invest in connectivity versus just being you know satisfying with the growth model that one had before. That's I, I'm trying to think of a biological analogy. I mean. You can't live without your head, I guess, would be an <laughs> all the simple one. I mean, you know, it's it's not either or uh, for these countries. You know, it, again, that's a very sort of American view because we have the lowest trade to GDP ratio amongst advanced economies. But look at let's like let's pretend you're Germany for a minute. Germany can't live without trade. It's not an either or proposition. If that's true for Germany, you know very well that it's true for Singapore and Thailand and all the countries in, in the Asian region. So they have to continue to invest in connectivity. There is literally no survival without it unless you're a really large, unless you're China itself. And let's be clear that China's trade to GDP ratio has fallen precipitously, which is great for them, it makes them more like America to some degree. And that's why you see them, how important the massive uh, rebound, or, or at least the kind of, you know, they've, they've, they've put a floor on the drop, on the kind of drop off in economic activity. They just had the May, the spring festival. So instead of, you know, a usual 65, 35 or, or 70, 30 split of travel, you know, domestic versus international, pretty much, you know, 85, 90% of Chinese stayed domestic you had like full hotel occupancy and so on and so forth. So China can, can rebound through consumption. Uh, other countries can't do it as well as, uh, as China can. Although China's having some issues now, right? Because there's 6% urban unemployment, but when you include migrants, it could be as high as 20%. And well, you know, we, 
we know not to believe any of their numbers anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, uh, if we're off by, you know, a, a, a few decimal points here and there, who's going to know? The key thing is what do they do with it, right? And, and I noticed that Bloomberg had a piece yesterday uh, reported from Don Juan. And back in connectography, I went back and I talked about my drive around the whole Pearl River Delta, and I made Don Juan a centerpiece of my... Of of course, my a factory town where a lot of... Yeah, exactly. So I compared Don Juan in 2008 to Don Juan in 2014. And what you saw, and of course, this may be you know, worse in some ways than, than 2008, but 2008 was really bad for Don Juan, let's be absolutely clear. You had massive, uh, large-scale unemployment. You remember this, you saw this, you were probably there. Um, Chinese people had to move. They had to get on the trains and find new jobs and circulate. This is pre huko reform, right? It was even tougher to do this back then. Now, again, what you'll see is, look, Chinese will just have to move. You know, they'll move around and they'll find new jobs. And eventually, if Dongguan recovers and reinvents itself and the business model changes, they'll come back. That's the importance of, you know, sort of, sort of social or, or at least physical mobility to economic uh, recovery. So sure, unemployment's high right now, but we know that China has a way, has ways, I should say, of keeping people busy. Yeah. You've written about how historically there was a, an Afro-Eurasian trade system uh, and that with the Belt and Road as China conceived it, has conceived it, still conceives it, Africa's part of you know, what it's thinking of, what, you know, where it's been investing, um, where it's been building roads and railways and investing in ports. It has its first overseas military base in Djibouti, which is a little bit separate. It's also investing in Latin America. There, there's an Arctic Silk Road. You know, as, as the Chinese government thinks about where do we put our resources? Uh, and in fact, the National People's Congress meets exactly 24 hours from now in China for a truncated one week uh, session, annual session. Usually it's more like 12 days. They have a lot of thinking to do. They have a lot of decision making to do. Um, and some of it they do well in advance, but a lot of things have happened in the last couple of months. Do you think that there might be some scaling back of the extensions of the Belt and Road that go outside of Asia? I mean, it's one thing to invest in your own backyard and another thing to extend your network, maybe to overextend to the point right. that you as a creditor are also at risk. Yeah. So let's talk about pre versus post pandemic. Again, pre pandemic, exactly what you just described has already been happening. And I, and I, and I showed the data, right? Significant capital reallocation away from either territories that have been restrictive of Chinese activity anyway, like Europe and, and North America in terms of investment restrictions, and reallocation towards West Asia, Central Asia, Russia, Southeast Asia, right? So that was happening anyway. So that kind of hunkering down in the immediate region and making sure that one gets those things right, because without um, you know, having, you know, sort of without having stability in one's own periphery, how can you exercise global power projection, right? Mm -hmm. Also, second trend pre-pandemic is basically, I don't want to say throwing Africa under the bus, because largely speaking, the rise of Asia has been the best thing that's happened to Africa in the last 25 years because of the, the, the diversification of Africa's own commodities exports to fast-growing regions. So this broader Indian Ocean drew European mm -hmm. and American attention back to Africa after many years. It did. Yeah. And, you know, and that's what arms races are all about. You know, and it was ever thus, uh, you know, it, that's why I said, like, you know, before Belt and Road, you didn't have the, Euro the European Asia connectivity initiative. You didn't have the American blue dot network. You didn't have the Japanese Indian, uh, you know, connectivity corridors. You have those things because of Belt and Road. It's the action, it's the reaction to China's action. And that's the way the world works, right? But this Afro-Eurasian thing, uh, you know, and, and you, you've got to read the work of, you know, Valerie Hansen and all the great historians that have looked at the 16th century Indian Ocean trading system when Europe, Africa, Asia was the world, basically, right? Uh, except for the, the nascent uh, Spanish, you know, silver trade. Um, it's an incredibly rich historical era that I simply refer to, you know, in the book to try to recover kind of from a, from a long-term perspective, what is happening. The return of the Afro-Eurasian system is also something that's irrevocable. It will have its fits and starts, 
and therefore, you know, Africa is a part of part of that in a ways that it hasn't been in centuries, or I mean, that it hasn't been really since the mid nineteenth century when uh, when the British Empire was moving lots of uh, South Asians in particular over to Africa and so forth. Uh, so you've got this recovery of Afro-Eurasia, but China, how strong is its commitment to countries? Well, let's look specifically at places like Angola or like Congo, right? If we were having this conversation five years ago, we'd be saying, well, Angola and Congo are becoming wholly owned subsidiaries of China Inc. Today, you look at it and say, you know what? It turns out that China doesn't really, really need Angolan oil that much anymore. It's piping in Russian gas right, and, and so on. So when it's diversifying anyway, it's investing massively in alternatives and renewables. What China was doing in Africa was a hedge, right, a hedge against the commodities bottleneck in terms of uh, oil and gas dependency of flows through the Straits of Malacca from the Persian Gulf and from Africa. But it, with, to the extent that China no longer needs cobalt from Congo, because every Chinese person has like two mobile phones now, uh, and to the extent it doesn't need oil from Angola and whatever it's getting from a couple other countries, it's going to cut back. It's going to come back. So in the NPC, starting tomorrow, are they really going to be talking about Africa that much? Of course not. Like, not even close. It's not even remotely a priority, right? Uh, you know, it's always been about what the tactical need is, not about a strategic vision for global hegemony. So, you know, uh, what, what, I, what I think we'll see is a continuation of what's been happening in the last couple of years, which is a manifestly more regional focus. And that's smart, of China to do. They've got a lot of, you know, um, uh, relations to repair in this immediate region and nothing matters more for China, quite frankly, than its 14 uh, neighbors. It does have more neighbors than any other country in the world. They've got to, man they've got to nurture those, those ties. Um, one question about India, and then I have a couple about the U.S. itself. Um, you had said earlier that India has a little bit more of a cushion. Um, what, what, how so? Well, again, in the sense that when we think about the relationship between or the you know, trade dependence on growth and investment as well, of course, India wants and needs these things. But when you have a billion people in a largely services uh, driven economy, services, agriculture and, and, and so forth, uh, you know, you can you can survive. You can become more autarkic uh, as well. And you, you just have to focus on reviving uh, the, the the internal uh, dynamics around, uh, of course, just opening up the economy, allowing people to move, doing so in a healthy way, and so forth. So again, that is the kind of cushion that countries like Indonesia and India have. Would India grow faster with proper, credible foreign investment regulation and you know more trade and exports? So of course, it would, right? Um, but on the other hand, you know, there's lots of you know, entrenched uh, special interests in India. And, you know, they, I mentioned uh, just briefly that they didn't join the RCEP. Well, that's because software exports weren't covered in RCEP. So why would they, you know, with the substantial deficit that India has with respect to China and uh, ASEAN and Japan, that, that just would have, you know, it would have expanded further. So instead they're saying, look, India still wants to trade a lot more with, you know, to the East, but it wants to do so on its own terms. And I, I think that's actually quite logical from the Indian uh, point of view. So India is looking East, um, you know, in a very credible way, uh, both strategically and economically. But in terms of the domestic cushion, that's the point I was making. And again, in, in, in the previous instances of a trade downturn, the, the, the mantra, the theory still holds, generally speaking, that a large population that's consumption driven is going to be able to ride these things out better than a completely export dependent economy, which India most certainly isn't. So about 15 years ago, there, there was this term that was coined Chindia. There was this you know, sort of expectation that China and India would be these two giants that would rise together uh, as, as rapidly growing economies. Now, obviously, India didn't grow as fast as China. Um, Chinese looked to Indian infrastructure and were like, what, were you kidding yourselves? And Indians looked to China and say, we did the tough work already. You know, we actually are a democracy. We have a free press. Um, India has a, a younger population. Um, it has a lot going for it. It has some significant drags, like women are not well-educated or well-integrated into the workforce. Do you see a scenario as a future scenario planner whereby India plays the kind of role economically in its region that China already does in East Asia? Whew, great question. Uh, so, you know, I've always mocked, quite frankly, the term Chindia and the acronym BRICS. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, you know, I've, I've, I've definitely gotten some mileage at, at their expense uh, of those acronyms over the years because they are farcical. Uh, you know, no one, I mean, there is a joke in India that people talk ambitiously, aspirationally about how India can rival China until they actually make their first trip to China, after which they're mute for two weeks, uh, you know, which is very difficult for an Indian to do, I can attest. Uh, so, you know, I mean, so India knows it cannot and will not ever, you know, I don't want to say ever, but, uh, you know, it, it's not in the foreseeable future, an economic rival uh, to China. That said, Again, I'm much more bullish generally going from like a, on a scale of zero to 10. I used to treat India like a one and now I treat it like a four or a five, right? So it, it's, it's a lot of things have happened that I try to be objectively positive on, even as someone who's, you know, quite, quite critical of things that are some of the things going on there. But the investment in infrastructure, very necessary. Uh, fast forwarding to the present. The fact that at a very high level, Indians are getting together, public and private sector, and saying, we've got to capitalize in this moment and get supply chains into this country. They've succeeded in the last few years with aerospace, with pharmaceuticals, even with Apple now, you know, saying final assembly of iPhones in the Indian market is going to be done in India. They're trying, you know, obviously huge expansion of software in other areas. So a lot of things are going well, or, or at least the momentum is on India's side in some of these areas. Again, you mentioned the demographic, the demographics, which are, which are propitious, but, you know, talk about youth unemployment, right? I don't really worry about that in China nearly as much as I do in India. Let's be clear. You know, let's talk about the pollution and all of these other things. Again, inequality, uh, 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 social, of course, um, kind of uh, uh, social issues and disparities like women, minorities, and so forth. Uh, you know, India's just as as just as tough a road ahead, let's say. Uh, from a climate standpoint, it's a pretty devastating picture. You know, you said, look to the future. Well, you know, pull up those maps of, um, you know, what's going to happen in terms of uh, mean temperature, uh, you know, obviously groundwater supply and all of these kinds of things. It's, it's a devastating picture for India unless they continue, unless they do have a real, another green revolution. Uh, unless they do a lot more with water desalination, unless they curb industrial pollution and a million other things that have to go right uh, for India. So it, it's, it's bumpy. Now, in terms of India and its regional dynamics, so, you know, the Sark region is economically insignificant compared to East Asia, right? Um, and, and of course, there's geopolitical tensions there that don't see, show any sign of abating. So, uh, you know, and in, internal trade in SARC is, is abysmal. It's, it's more or less non-existent uh, for obvious uh, geopolitical reasons. So what you've seen India do strategically over the last 20 years is to graduate from the kind of view that we used to impute or impose on them. And this, I remember working on these kinds of white papers when I was at Brookings, you know, making India a continental balancer to China. That's not something that India was actually really ever comfortable with. India is in its heart in many ways a maritime uh, power and what India has done over the last uh, couple of decades is to invest massively in its naval modernization and expansion and it's the, what, what they call the Chola dynasty view right the kind of medieval uh, maritime expansionist kind of approach and, and you can be very confident that the Indian Ocean is never really going to become a Chinese lake right uh, certainly that's what China intends for the South China Sea plausible but also certainly to evoke confrontation but the uh, Indian Ocean is going to be a very multipolar region with India, the United States, and even European powers having a, a much more dominant, you know, and influential role than, than anything China will ever be able to muster uh, from a maritime uh, standpoint. So that's where India is most comfortable. Uh, but in Central Asia, you don't really see, uh, uh, you know, any, any so strong degree of Indian inf influence the way you do see China's. So one more question for me, and then I'm going to go to one of the questions from the audience. Um, what kind of relevance can America reasonably expect to maintain in a strengthening and ever more connected Asia? And how should Americans and American leaders in particular, and I'm not necessarily talking about current American leaders, but going forward in the long term, adjust their expectations and attitudes to best serve American interests? Um, right. So, you know, that's uh, obviously a central question here. And, um, you know, one of the things I, I point out um, in the Asia book is, you know, America is not an Asian power, it's a Pacific power, right? You know, we think of ourselves as having ordered the Asian region through the post-war alliance system, and we did. 
And you know, America's role in providing a security umbrella is certainly one of the, and, and obviously having a, an, an overwhelming amount of uh, political influence in the in the internal affairs of Japan and South Korea and so forth has been part of the reason that these countries constituted the first waves of post-war Asian growth and really set the role, became the role models for China itself in many ways, let's not forget. So America's influence has been definitive in bringing Asia to where it is, you know, up until say circa the last, you know, last, de last decade, but or last decade and a half. But since the Asian financial crisis, Asia did begin to take on a momentum of its own. They learned the lessons of the crisis they began to open up more, deregulate, build those huge trade surpluses, currency reserves, and so forth. To some degree, they follow the Washington Consensus playbook, even though it's the term they, that they hate the most, right? But, the, you know, some degree of economic orthodoxy, you know, has helped uh, propel Asia to where it is now, and a huge amount of regional confidence. So now you have... Um, Asian internal diplomacy as well through the through the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and lots of bilateral you know and regional instruments having built up some degree of work you know working level relations and cooperation otherwise Belt and Road wouldn't be happening nor all of the other things and the, you know obviously bring trade barriers down I mean lots more labor mobility as well within the region huge growth in labor mobility so Asia even though all of the conflict scenarios all the major conflict scenarios of the world are still here in the greater Asian region, you've seen them able to control the, the tension. And the U.S., therefore, other than in these very, very important, you know, critical issues like Taiwan and South China Sea, for example, um, other than that, you have, uh, you know, more of a divergence in perspectives where Asians say, look, don't rock the boat. We really appreciate freedom of navigation operations and support through the Quad Alliance, but don't pretend that we want to engage in a open-ended century-long new Cold War with China, right? Again, as, I, as uh, we were discussing before, it's, it's a po largely post-colonial region. The idea of being divided and ruled is not appetizing uh, to the, the populations of Asia, many of which are alive still who remember, the de generations are alive, my own parents remember colonialism and the Cold War. I mean, you know, you'd have to be really dumb to be fooled three times. And Asians are actually not that dumb, <laughs> conveniently. They're actually highly intelligent beings, surprise, surprise. So you can't, they can't be fooled. They can't be fooled by China, they can't be fooled by America. And that's why, again, I, I violently resist the idea that America and China are carving up Asia. Right, nothing of the sort is actually happening. Not even remotely is that happening. Right, every country in this region is very, very shrewd about balancing both and getting maximum benefits from both relationships as well as any others they can at the same time. And hence, you have a much more fluid picture. So, what does the U.S. have to do? I mean, well, you know, this is very trite at this point, but TPP, right? Hello, uh, this is a region that thinks with its wallet. Uh, you know, as much as we. Again, we ascribe to them being driven by national pride and, you know, sort of uh, uh, nationalist, you know, almost fanaticism. Again, not true. Most pragmatic region of the world, probably by far, is Asia uh, because they don't cross the line into conflict, right? They think entirely and almost entirely in economic terms and that nationalism is a veneer that fortunately doesn't dictate uh, many of their policies. So to not have joined TPP sent a very negative signal. Uh, and in any case now, if you think about, um, you know, it's sort of, I think, uh, uh, Asians have come to view the United States as uh, divided between what politicians do and what companies do, right? And companies largely remain pragmatic. They, they are investing in Asia because they want to access Asian markets. And if you're not part of TPP, that therefore means that you've got to actually produce here even more so because you don't have tariff equalization. Um, so you see, you know, you've seen growth overall in, in American investment here in this, uh, in this region. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, and even with respect to Belt and Road, by the way, I'll be, I'll be blunt, I've never met an American executive who does not wish that the United States had actually joined Belt and Road in some way, because now it's all Chinese and Europeans getting in on those uh, projects, right? Uh, so that's that's one thing. Tech is a bit different because tech never had that direct onshore, you know, sort of strength. Uh, the software, obviously, in terms of hardware, well, we know we're following what Intel and Qualcomm are are navigating right now in China uh, every day. But software, you know, and social media and so forth, they've managed to thrive in in Asia, ex China because China has never been a big market for them. And you can see their presence growing and growing. I, I live here in Singapore, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Google, whatnot, they double in size in terms of headcount, you know, every uh, couple, of, couple of years. So they, that engagement is very beneficial and Asians look at that in a very positive light. 
Uh, so here's a question from Hugh Lester. What countries are hedging the risks of their U.S. and China relationships the best? Right. So in this case, hedging means, again, you know, uh, maximizing uh, in, in, in both dimensions, not sort of, you know, curtailing. Um, you know, so, you know, Singapore perennially has to, has to juggle this and, and do it well. It's still the, the number one destination um, in uh, Southeast Asia for American uh, foreign investment. Uh, you know, it's really the, the conduit for most American foreign investment uh, into the region. So, so, so Singapore. Uh, Thailand probably as well. Um, you know, Korea is a country that's in a tight spot, right? You know, they have to, it's a, it's a binary proposition, whether you're going to host the THAAD missile defense system or not going to host the missile defense system. You can't half host an American missile defense uh, system. And when you do do it, you earn huge opprobrium from, uh, from China. And then suddenly, you know, Chinese tourists don't show up in Jeju Island and K-pop groups are banned and Korean cosmetics never find their way onto the shelves in, in Chinese uh, stores and that kind of thing. So Korea is in a bit of a trap and uh, it's, it's, having, it's really struggling to navigate uh, you know, US versus uh, China. But countries that are a bit further away, um, uh, like Singapore and, and, and Thailand are doing probably a better job of it. Australia is another country that's in a bit of a trap, obviously, as well, um, when it comes to how they manage, uh, you know, pressure to, um, you know, obviously reinforce and remain a very strong anchor, which they're committed to be, obviously, of uh, kind of Western-led alliance dynamics uh, in, in Asia versus their, their humongous dependency on exports of uh, commodities to, to China. Uh, so here's another question. Um, and basically, I'll preface this by saying, you know, we talked about debt diplomacy and how China doesn't necessarily set, all, set out to entrap countries, but a lot of countries have looked to Sri Lanka's experience and have been a little spooked. So the question is, with many BRI countries now unable to make their debt payments, Will Beijing end up taking critical national assets that were put up as collateral? And does Beijing really want to do that? It won't play well internationally. Right. So it's a great question, but I, I, this is one where we really have to be clear about our, our kind of sequencing. The countries that have the highest outstanding debt to China are the countries that already had pre-Belt and Road, before Belt and Road existed, they already were heavily indebted countries and a huge share of their outstanding debt was to China, right? So in a way, what's, you know, if you go from 50% of your outstanding, you know, debt obligations to China to 70%, um, it's not like it's, it's something new, right? You've taken what was already there to a new level, but you're also talking about countries that have to borrow to grow. If they don't borrow, they can't invest. If they don't invest, they'll never grow. I would say that we also shoulder some of the blame for not helping these countries access capital. Because if you, you know, uh, if you, if you, if the World Bank and IMF and the U.S. and European creditors uh, help these countries, you know, become investment grade, you would, they wouldn't be in extreme a trap uh, as they are now. So I think it, you know, there's sort of take two hands to clap on this kind of thing. Now let's go to Sri Lanka, because I think this is interesting. The Sri Lankans themselves go to great pains to point out that they needed to cut this deal with China in order to raise the capital to pay off uh, impending payments to the World Bank and other creditors, not to China itself, right? So they, China, Sri Lanka is heavily in debt, but it's heavily in debt, you know, across the board, <laughs> not just their debt to everybody, right? So what they were doing was just shuffling cards on the, on the table here. They were not suddenly mortgaging themselves uh, to uh, China, right? Now they did, lose a sort of, you know, have to issue this lease for, uh, for, for Amantota Port and so forth, and that didn't go over well. And so the optics of that have been critical in the, in the democratic dynamics of Sri Lanka, because now it's very difficult, even though somehow the Rajapaksa clan, you know, it's not exactly, uh, it's not exactly Norwegian like democracy, right, or, or, or Swiss democracy here. So somehow the Rajapaksa clan, you know, wingles its way back into power. But even they, pro or Chinese leaning as they are, can't really get away, given the transparency that fortunately does exist in that society, get away with selling the farm, you know, if you will, uh, you know, these white elephant kinds of projects to China as they did before. So the most important thing to remember, again, is com complex dynamics. The day after the Hamantota fiasco became public, from Kenya to Pakistan to Kazakhstan, everywhere else, 
each of those cabinets got together and they said, how do we avoid becoming the next Sri Lanka? And the reason you're not going to have another Sri Lanka episode is because the Sri Lanka episode happened and everyone saw it and needs to, and has taken steps to hedge themselves against it. Hence, never make linear projections, right, in geopolitics or quite frankly in anything else. So sure, the, the pandemic creates the financial conditions where you can see a exact bureaucratic pathway from these countries needing to default on debt to China taking certain assets. But again, the transparency, the pressure uh, in all of this is, is leaning on China very heavily to forgive these debts, to write some of them down, uh, to suspend interest and principal payments. There'll be efforts, there'll be huge efforts. It's not, not a future tense, it's happening right now. Uh, negotiations to start to restructure this debt and to you know, sort of repackage it, securitize it, whatever, you know, have multilaterals and other creditors take some of it over to avoid China being put in the spotlight in terms of uh, you know, achieving more extraterritorial possessions, which again, are not really gonna be all that useful because everyone's got satellites trained on watching them you know, 20, 24, seven to see if China decides to park so much as a submarine you know, in Sri Lanka or elsewhere, the whole world goes ballistic when that happens. So th these are not really useful assets. Anyway. So question from Matt Sheehan, how would you describe attitudes in India toward Chinese technology products, both among normal people and the government? Is there a desire and any real action to promote local startups at the expense of Chinese or American tech giants? Oh, sure. Sure, absolutely. No, look, India is one of the few countries in the world that basically has achieved kind of full stack, right? I mean, you know, because it is, a, you know, more open technology market certainly than China is, that's why Amazon and Walmart and, and everyone's come in there. And Chinese uh, tech companies, you know, have a huge presence now and some of the top gaming, uh, you know, uh, apps and social media networks and so forth have a Chinese imprint, uh, either in terms of the software or the investment. So China has a huge presence in India. It's motivated Indians to, um, you know, respond. They're developing their own super cheap mobile handsets. Um, again, you know, what, what Reliance is doing with uh, building out mobile uh, connectivity and infrastructure. Again, full software stack in the country uh, for, for mobile payments and so forth. So India doesn't actually need, um, you know, software imports or, or uh, you know, imports in the tech space. Uh, it's much more resilient to that than, than Europe is, right? I mean, it's Europe that is the weakest among great powers and having an indigenous development uh, in, in, in these areas. So India can be very common. And that's why, again, India has now a past, you know, dropped the hammer really a couple of weeks ago and said there can be no Chinese, you know, beneficial owner um, of, uh, of investments in India in strategic uh, sectors. And India just doesn't even need it anyway when it comes to, to technology. So there's, th this is again, pre-COVID. It's, it's quite frankly, India's push towards technological self-sufficiency even predates, uh, you know, Huawei controversies and the substantial rise of Chinese uh, foreign investment into India. It's a self-motivated thing, but it never hurts to have that, that motivational spark either. Last and by the way, one last thing, sorry, AI, you know, this is critical because, uh, you know, I love Kai-Fu Lee as much as anyone else, but in terms of, uh, you know, this, this prediction of a kind of, bi again, bipolar world, we, we hear it so often, it's such an easy framing to fall back on, a new Cold War, a bifurcated world and so forth. Again, technology diffusion is such a rapid process, and if you look at the rise of AI as a service, in the software sector in India and the global investment going into it, it's a much more plausible scenario that you have competition in the global landscape for uh, AI data, you know, big data, machine learning, and other kinds of services uh, in terms of India playing a role in it in a competitive way, in a way that protects, of course, the data integrity and privacy of clients, certainly more than China would. So I don't view, again, I, I view India in that dimension as also being a really key global player and, and countries wanting to emulate the Indian model and work with India rather than having this false choice between, you know, Chinese 5G and Chinese uh, software architecture versus American. That's, again, not really the way the world works. I'm going to sneak in a very quick question, very quick answer. Um, but it's a hard question to answer quickly. So, you know, we're in the midst of this moment where, you know, uh, 
greenhouse gas emissions have plummeted, what do you think the chances are that we actually use this moment to figure out a way to build out the global supply chain and infrastructure in a way that's more sustainable? 30 seconds. Country by country, yes. You know, you see in Europe a very strong push that, you know, stimulus needs to be tied to a Green New Deal and, and that globally this should also be the case to the extent that we're looking at multilateral lines of credit and so on. And that, that awakening in places where that awakening is already there, like Europe, which is far more evolved, you know, kind of psychologically, environmentally. Sure. Again, it was already happening. You have grid parity in most European countries. In the U.S., you know, uh, I, I don't. I don't think so. If the four, if part four, phase four of the stimulus, you know, if the Democrats get their way and phase four involves Green New Deal support, I mean, sure, that would be fantastic. Again, from the corporate side, it's already well baked in that one should be doing alternative and renewable solar and so forth in the United States. So it's doable. India, you know, not not so clear because there's still far too much state support for some of these dirty areas like coal and, and so forth. So they haven't cleaned up their act. So it'll be country by country. I wish we had more time. It's really flown. Um, thank you so much, Parag. Uh, someone asked in, the, in questions whether your slides are available, but I believe the video will be available. Margaret, um, over to you. Thank you. Oh, go for it. Thank you, Mary Kay and Parag. Uh, detailed, dense discussion. And we had a lot of questions still, so you guys are definitely going to have to come back. And yes, this is recorded. We will have this put up on our website. Um, for everyone at home, if you are not a member, please consider joining. We do have 13 centers around the world. Right now, all of our programs are virtual. And if you're a member, we're offering them for free. So there is tons of content out there. That value uh, is a really good valued membership. Uh, we're also still taking donations. We are a nonprofit. Our fiscal close is at the end of June. So we are working hard to close our books. A few uh, upcoming programs that you may be interested in. On June 2nd, we're going to host a mindful meditation led by one of our Asia 21 young leaders. On June 3rd, we are very close to confirming the U.S. ambassador to, uh, to China, Terry Branstad. Keep an eye on our website. We will let you know as soon as that gets locked down. On June 10th, we have Wendy Cutler from our Policy Institute. She's going to talk about China trade. And on July 31st and August 1st, for the first time, we're going to launch a virtual teachers workshop. We have a really amazing lineup of speakers, and that's as we enter classrooms with our programming.